Welcome to Make More Marbles. My name is Brad Hart, and we're here to interview the game changers, the future makers, the co-collaborators and creators who are here to collaborate with one another towards a better future for all of us. Enjoy the show. We've got a great guest coming up for you right now. Welcome to Make More Marbles. My name is Brad Hart, and today I am thrilled, excited, grateful, and stoked to have David on the show today. Mr. David Heinemeyer Hansen. And if you don't know that name, you should, because David is the founder and creator of a popular project management software that I use and some other folks use, like DrawShop, called Basecamp. But he's also, more interestingly in my book, he's the creator of Ruby on Rails, which has gone on to be creating you know, a lot of the wonderful apps on the internet that we enjoy, uh, as well as web apps and development. Um, you know, I don't want to use the wrong words here, so I will allow him in his own words to kind of tell us a little bit about some of the things he's worked on. So David, why don't you give us a, just kind of a, a journey so far? You know, talk about some of the wins and losses over the years and some of the things you've learned along the way. Sure. So the two things you mentioned, obviously, are the center of my professional career. I created Basecamp together with Jason Fried and uh, the rest of 37 Signals back in 2003, which was also sort of the year when I went serious with Ruby. Um, and funnily enough, that was really only a couple of years after I'd learned to program for real. Uh, I'd always sort of dabbled with things along the way with programming, but it wasn't really until the early 2000s that I started doing it more, more seriously. And it was really then discovering Ruby, the programming language that ignited my sense of contribution to the programming world. And that sense of contribution was born out of and extracted from the work we did on Basecamp. Um, when we first got started with Basecamp, I was the sole developer. Um, Jason was doing the sign, Ryan was doing the sign, Matt was doing the sign and some copywriting. And that was basically the four of us at 37 Signals and in the beginning as the company was called back then. So there was just a lot of things we couldn't do. You have one developer, like what are you gonna do? There's a lot of ways of building software that's just not accessible to a one man shop. So that was really the need that brought me to Ruby and got me started with Rails was simply building technology that'll allow tiny companies and single individuals, not even working full time, to create the kind of businesses that, um, that we build with Basecamp. So that kind of became a focal point for my interest, not just in technology, but in sort of business development in general. How can we create narratives tools, information that will allow small uh, groups of entrepreneurs to independently create businesses, create things online, create software, and, and sell that and enrich the world in a way that does not require them to lean on people lending them money in the form of venture capital for equity or banking for, for other ways that like, hey, you can build awesome businesses like Basecamp, like we build it on the side with these tools that are freely available. It's never been cheaper and easier to do those things. Um, and that has just been something that's been inspiring to me for the past uh, 15 years. So there's the technology side of that. And then there's, as I said, the narrative and, and the informational side of that. Um, over the years, we've written a handful of books that started with Getting Real in 2006, I believe, which was born out of a series of workshops we created called uh, The Building of Basecamp. Because when we first launched Basecamp, just the four of us, a lot of people came up and, and asked, like, how did you guys do that? Like, I thought building software on this scale, like, took huge teams and back then, big Oracle licenses and, and all sorts of stuff. And they were like, how did you guys do it? So we put up together a series of workshops where we talked it through. That then turned into the book, Getting Real, which then um, about four years later turned into the book, Rework, which is sort of our, our biggest book. It's it sold about half a million copies around the world in I think 22 different languages. And, and it's really the story, again, about how we built Basecamp, the lessons we took away and the inspiration and the counter narrative to the traditional entrepreneurship line on how you're supposed to build a business, how you're supposed to raise money, how you're supposed to do this, that, and the other thing. And we basically said, well, I mean, sure, you can do it like that, or you can do it like we've done it. And, um, and that was sort of the pitch. Um, we followed that up with a book called uh, Remote in 2014, talking all about the 
way of working remotely, um, which we've always done that. When I started working with Jason back in 2003, I was working from Copenhagen, Denmark, seven time zones away from Chicago, where Jason was based. And we just started working together. We never saw a problem with that. And then it wasn't until we were well into the development of our company that I realized that a lot of people saw that as something weird, that you could build a company remote that you could work together remotely and not only just weird that it was sort of like a deficiency and like oh isn't that like, holding you guys back isn't it doing all these other things and it was just so bewildering to me to to get that kind of pushback so we wrote a book all about the whys why remote work is a great way to go and and the how how you can do it and how you can turn it into yourself and that brings us almost up to today um i've been working on Basecamp on uh, Ruby on Rails for the past 15 years now, writing about both of them, creating software and uh, and continuing to speak about the way we build businesses and, and, and use software to do so. Could you, uh, that's a great, very well polished story, by the way, and I really appreciate you had all the, the ups and downs and bits and pieces there. And I recommend everybody check out those books. You got Getting Real, you got Remote, you got Rework, um, which are all kind of a for better, lack of a better word, it's like the follow-up to the four-hour work week. Okay, cool. We get the power of leveraging different economies. Now, how do you really put it into practice? And how do you manage all that in different time zones, different cultures, and different things? I mean, we've got people and clients from all over the world that make more marble, so I totally get that. I'm going to be picking up one of those books, which I haven't even checked out yet. But uh, what I really want to understand are some of the leadership lessons and the failures along the way, because you know, people see somebody like yourself, and you know, they can respect you for your successes, as we all do. What are the things that we can really relate to, the failures that every single human being has a, has a story about? Sure. So the funny thing is, when I look back on the trajectory of, of what we've done with Basecamp and, and my professional careers, I don't look at any of the steps as failures. To me, it's all part of it. Um, it's all part of that journey. To, to get where I am today, I needed to take the road that I took. So... A lot of times I kind of get questions uh, like, um, what's the one thing you would have told yourself in the past that you would have wished you'd done, done differently? And my answer is always nothing. I didn't want to know anything. Like the journey and the discovery uh, was as much part of the fun as anything. If, if someone had just come along and handed me all the conclusions, it's kind of like summering all great works of art. And it's like, there was a man, he liked a woman, they went on a journey and they got married. Like what the, that is not interesting, right? Like I need to experience this journey myself, um, which I mean, of course, that doesn't mean that we didn't take lessons along the way and so on. Of course we did, but I, I don't want to go back to my former self and, and try to impart this wisdom on, uh, on myself because in part it doesn't work like that. Uh, one of the metaphors I've, I've really taken to heart is, um, I think it was Clayton Christensen who talks about um, having space in your brain for lessons and for advice. And a lot of the time, I simply did not have space in my brain. The slots were not open for the lessons that I came to learn over the years if I had just tried to jam it all in on day one, right? I needed to go through all the trials and tribulations that we've gone through growing the company to be able to be ready to simply understand and internalize those lessons. So, I mean, again, that, that's, that's sort of a little bit of a glib answer to it, but, but it's also no, no, it's true that. though, and and I guess I wasn't. I guess I just like to sh show people that you're human, right? That's really the the point of that question is to just say, hey, you went through some stuff, you didn't always get it right, but in doing so, you became the author and the reader of your story at the same time, right? Absolutely, you got and I mean, I think that that's that's really where where the point is because, for example. When I look back at my trajectory, like I didn't want to take any other path. That didn't mean that everything worked at all. When Jason and I first started working together, we built an application called um, Single File. Jason mm. had been building FileMaker Pro apps for the Mac back in the late uh, 90s. I used FileMaker 10 years ago. That thing is a beast. <laughs> yes. And he wanted to convert this into, into web application because he had been doing work for, for clients and he was trying to learn how to do it. And that was actually how we met. Jason was trying to convert these FileMaker Pro apps into PHP and he was struggling a bit with it. So he wrote a thing on his blog. I wrote him an email out of the blue, never met the guy uh, saying like, hey, here's how you do it. And Jason just decided it was easier to hire me than to learn how to program. So we ended up working together, but that first application we created, single file, that didn't go anywhere. Like we put all this effort and time into it and 
I mean, it wasn't a flop as in like no one showed up, but it certainly wasn't base camp either, right? Sure. But going through that, as you say, like it was part of that journey. It was part of that realization. Oh, interesting. Like here was something that worked in the past on a shareware level. It didn't really translate in the same ways to online and kind of keeping an inventory of the physical books that you have and how you lend them out. This wasn't a big market, right? Um, and that was the same thing with, with Basecamp. It was funny is Basecamp didn't come around because we sat down and said, oh, let's build a product business. Let's come up with some idea. Let's brainstorm this out. Let's figure out how to, how to make a great application that can make us a lot of money. No, it came out of the fact that we were building web designs for clients. And we just realized managing all that stuff over email was, is a mess. You involve more than three people and any email chain devolves into a huge mess of who has the right file and did you get that message and blah, 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 right? And we just thought, that's not making us look professional. This is kind of like a bad look for us. Um, we can do better. We know how to build software. Let's just build some software to solve this problem for ourselves, right? So we started building this piece of software, Basecamp, for ourselves. And it wasn't until we were halfway through the process that we realized, hey, you know what? We have sort of the outline of something that maybe other people might be interested in using. So we talked to a couple of people in the industry, and they all said, hey, do you want my credit card? I, I need this. Like, we need right? this. We have the same problem, right? Like, our inboxes are a mess when it comes to project management. And clients, um, can we pay for this? And we went, uh, yes. And we then turned this thing that was halfway finished already as just an internal project into a product. Um, and then, I mean, just as another example, so we didn't know anything, right? Um, that was part of this whole journey. Like no one had given us all the facts, all the conclusions up front. So we didn't know anything, which meant that we thought, Hey, we could just charge like a yearly fee for this piece of software. Let's just charge four ninety nine for Basecamp every year. And we built it all out and we had this plan all laid out and we were just about ready to launch. And we were like, all right, we got to talk to the credit card processor, which back in the day was not as simple as just signing up for Stripe and then taking a credit card like five minutes later. That required mountains of paperwork and it required meeting with bankers and all sorts of annoying crap, right? And then we go through this whole process and they go like, yeah, what are you trying to do now? Mm, you're not, not going to sell anything on a yearly subscription basis. You're a, they didn't even call it startup. You're like a completely unknown quantity here. Um, what if you guys go out of business in two months? And all these clients, all these customers have paid you for a year. They're going to come back to us and say, we want our money back. And you guys are going to be out of business. No, you can't do that. You have to charge on a monthly basis. And we went, oh, shit. Uh, we built this whole thing out, right? So we just went like, okay, let's scrap this whole yearly billing system we have. Let's just launch the damn thing. And then we will have 30 days to build a new billing system. Because we're going to give everyone a 30-day trial. And... That's what we did. When we launched Basecamp, it originally did not have any billing system. It didn't have a way of collecting credit cards. It didn't have any of those things. We just thought like, well, if no one shows up on day one, first of all, right, we will not have wasted our time building a billing system if no one's willing to pay for it. And second of all, let's just get it out here and, and see how it goes. So we launched the thing 27 days later when three days before the first customers were supposed to pay for it, we had a billing system and we could-, um, we could I love it. that. Yeah, because most people, they do everything except be an entrepreneur, right? They go and they start a bank account and an LLC and they get business cards and all this stuff. You didn't even have a way to get paid and you had the product out there in people's hands and they were giving you valuable feedback so you could make it better in the meantime, which for so, you guys, you know, is, is really easy to just take that feedback and code it. Um, now, have you been a coder all your life? Like, where did you get started with that? Yeah, you started nope. as a Yeah, oh, no. nope, nope. Um, I mean, I'd always been involved with computers in one form or another, um, but I hadn't been a programmer all my life. I tried to learn how to program. I tried to learn several times. Um, I think first time when I was six or seven, getting magazines were at the back of the magazines, there'd be games typed out and you could turn to the back of the magazine and you could type it in. I had an Amstrad 646 um, when I was six years old and I, I tried to type in a couple of games and I got like one or two semicolons wrong and nothing worked i don't think i ever got a game working i was actually i had one of those basic computers you know and i could code like the little game where you had the the two clowns and the trampoline and you had to pop the balloons and yep. i coded thing i used to play with my dad we got it to break one day and it would just completely go around in a circle and just keep popping balloons so we'd like run over the the clock on the uh and the point system and it would start over we just unplug the controller and watch it rack up points all day it was super fun so that's totally. awesome i never got that far so my programming skills were not even sufficient for me to type in a, um, 
a piece of software from the back of a magazine. But then I tried again a couple of, well, I shouldn't say a couple. I, maybe when I was 12 or 13, I tried another game. I mean, I was always interested in games. That was my attraction to computers and home computing in general. It was all about games. But the whole thing of building my own games, I just, I didn't have it. I, I didn't have any natural sort of talent in that department, I suppose. Um, but I still got involved with computers and I had a lot of friends who were programmers and um, most of those friends were programmers in the sort of what I consider hardcore sense of assembler and whatever development languages and, and tools that were used back then to create software. And that was all about vector programming and bitmaps this and bitmaps that and like none of it made any sense to me. So I just thought like that's not for me. And it was really until I discovered the web that I thought, oh, I guess I can kind of figure out what this HTML is, what this CSS thing is, and let's get some stuff up on the web. So it was born from my mm, sort of love of games. I was, I was creating these gaming websites, um, all about reviewing games and getting them online and getting these um, things up and running. And it just turned out it was kind of like easier for me to do that if I learned some of the stuff myself. Um, and then it wasn't until, yeah, I was in my late teens, early 20s, where I just decided, okay, I've worked with these programmers for long enough. It's a pain in the ass to ask them whenever I want to change anything on my damn site. I'm sure I can just change the file, right? All back then it was all PHP and ASP.net. And in many ways it was a better time. Like I, I think it's kind of like we've, we take huge steps forward in, in programming productivity on some levels. And we also made it infinitely more complicated to get started. Um, PHP in particular, I, thought was just such a great gateway. You had a single file that talked straight to the database and intertwined with HTML. It wasn't that complicated, right? So that's how I got started. Um, and still, so I was programming, so to speak. I didn't think of myself as a programmer at all. I didn't even think of myself as a programmer when I was kind of being paid somewhat to do programming. It really wasn't until I discovered Ruby and fell in love with programming that I thought, oh, maybe I'm a programmer. Hmm. I love that. And that's one of those pivotal moments that changes the world, right? You just started out by following your curiosity and all of a sudden you created a movement. Uh, can you speak to kind of the open source movement now and what uh, exciting things you see with maybe open AI or some of the future technologies that are coming down the pipe? Yes, it's interesting. Um, when I started with the web, the open source movement was already going pretty well. Um, some of the early tooling that I used was the Apache web server, MySQL database, PHP programming language. There was all this open source tooling. So I kind of got bred on, on open source, um, which is, I guess, different from, from other people at the time who were either in a, in a Microsoft or a Borland or whatever camp where they were used to paying for tooling and, and technology, or if they were working with Oracle or PL, SQL, and all those proprietary tools back in the day. I got going with open source from, from day one. So it was kind of like, in that sense, like remote, remote working. I'd always done remote working. So it, that just felt to me, that was the normal, like that was the, the baseline. And then there's all this weird proprietary software with the odd one out. Um, but I, I mean, I obviously clearly realized pretty quickly that just because I got up through that way, that wasn't the way the world spun, right? Like in the early 2000s, there was tons of proprietary software. Um, I worked at a couple of shops, including a Java and J2E shop for a while, where it was just all proprietary software. And I always thought that it was such a weird world. Um, but hey, I got going with this thing. And, and when I then started creating my own software, it wasn't even a discussion. I remember in the early days, people asked me, well, why didn't you release Ruby on Rails as a paid thing? Couldn't you make a lot of money? And I was like, what are you talking about? infrastructure software is supposed to be free, right? Like I was building on all these tooling. I feel like that's odd. If I take the database and the web server and all these things for free, and then my thing that I'm contributing, I say like, hey, you got to pay me for that. That just didn't sit right with my ethics at the time. I felt like I owed the open source community to share the things that I created. So that's what I did. And Ruby on Rails was open source from, from the get-go and from the start. And, and today, especially in the web world, and that's not even discussion. Even Microsoft, who back in the day was the staunch defender of proprietary software and proprietary development tools, they've all switched to open source, like all the web stuff that they're doing today, TypeScript and so on. It's all open source stuff. Um, so it's just been interesting to see that evolution. So to me, it's not really like, how is the open source movement different or whatever? The open source movement is everything. You look at any of the major tech and, and web companies today, they're all bred on open source. Um, 
everything from, from Google to Facebook to whatever, like they're releasing all their tooling as open source. This is just a standard way that we collaborate. Um, so to me, it's not really a distinction in that sense. Like software is open source when it gets, comes to infrastructure tooling and so on in these domains that we're talking about. Yeah, and I love that you've kind of made that distinction too, because the movement has survived through all these different iterations. It never stopped being a good idea. Obviously, the best answers come from crowdsourcing. A lot of smart people working on a problem eventually find the right solution. Um, can you, I guess there's a two-parter to that question. Can you speak a little bit about some of these open AI projects or, or VR, some of the things that you see coming that are really interesting opportunities and what you're excited about, what people should be getting focused on, perhaps maybe some of the languages they should be learning, like Solidity, for example, if they're going to code Ethereum contracts or, or what are your thoughts about people getting into the space now? Yeah, so, so what's interesting is from a consumer perspective, which is really where I am, I love what's going on in AR and, and virtual reality. I got a great taste of a proper VR setup a couple of years ago at our office when someone brought in a whole rig and I went like, oh, this is so obviously the future. But at the same time, all of that technology is exactly or feels to me exactly the same way that game programming did to me. It's all bitmaps and vectors and that I don't understand. So it, I'm really just a layman in that sense of it. Um, those are not my domains at all. I'm just a excited spectator and user and consumer of these things. Um, and obviously, it's great for people to get into it. I don't really know heads from tails for, for the Baltic of it. Where, where I apply my professional expertise is um, in web development and in information technology, in infrastructure and, and sort of backend systems. And then I let the people who sort of get the bitmaps and get the vectors, figure that out when it comes to VR and AR and all these other exciting opportunities. It sounds like you're more of a realist. What can I actually affect and take action on now? I'm more of like a visionary, like you're an integrator type. I get it. Okay, cool. So um, let's say I wanted to work with you or work for you. Uh, what, would, what would you give me advice about? Like, let's say I'm a coder or I'm somebody who wants to get involved with the project that you're working on, or you know, I'm sure you have conversations with friends. Like, what do you guys look for in the people you hire? Sure. So that's one of the things I think is wonderful about the open source movement is how in some specific ways, it's extremely accessible. I've worked with people, especially in the Ruby and Rails community. We have about, I think, 6,000 individual contributors who've contributed code to the Ruby and Rails framework over the years from, I think, just about every country in the world. And what really sort of matters to is this kind of the echoes of um, Gary V and what he espouses for entrepreneurs showing up and doing the work mm. really that takes you beyond 99% of everyone else uh, the number of people who in these communities are willing to show up and do the work is a tiny tiny minority of, of all the people using it which is totally as it should be like if everyone who used Ruby and Rails also wanted to contribute to it we'd have a, a traffic jam you can't process sort of contributions in terms of code at least from it reminds me of Wikipedia. Know, if everybody looking at this page right now donated a dollar we'd be done with the fundraiser thank you jimmy it, it, exactly <laughs> right like it just it, that's not how it works and that's not how it would want it to work i mean if you look at the, uh, it's a it's a power curve right like you have a, a handful of contributors who contributed a very large stake and then you have a very long tail who've rounded things out and uh, that's sort of just how i look at it like show up do the work and do work that you're interested in doing. I mean, there's a myriad of motivations that someone can apply to. Why do you want to do open source work? Why do you want to get involved with something like Ruby on Rails, for example? And I've always come back to the number, the easiest way to, to get into it is to work on something you care about. Work on your own personal problems. Contribute your uh, unique understanding because you worked on a problem. You hit a bug. You wanted a feature that wasn't already in the framework in some shape or form, right? Um, so that goes for, for some of it when it comes to the open source, uh, open source work. When it comes to who we hire as programmers at Basecamp, it's really not terribly different in, in many ways. Um, showing up, uh, doing just a little bit of effort. One of the things we're big on, for example, is um, when people apply, I don't care about resumes how long you've worked at some company in the past, doesn't, I, I don't care. What MIT degree that you have, this, that, and the other thing, I don't care. It's just not relevant. What's relevant to me is that someone shows up, does the work, and does great work. 
Um, so we try to look for indicators of that, right? And for me, a lot of it is just in something as simple as the cover letter. A lot of people will apply to a job at Basecamp and they'll just send their resume. And I mean, I'm sorry to say it, it goes straight into the dumpster. Like I never look at just resumes. I look at a hook in a cover letter to make me interested in this application, right? So just being a real human talking about like what you've done, why you're interested in the things you've worked on and uh, sort of explaining that in a sense that appeals to someone else who sits on the other end and has to read through 400 applications. I mean, that already puts you ahead of the pack. But then again, it also comes back to having done or doing the work and showing aptitude for it. Um, I always look at the actual code. A lot of people can talk a good game uh, and fewer than all those people can also create programs that I'm willing to work with, work on, uh, read. Uh, so uh, a lot of it is, is kind of like, um, you have to show the aptitude too. It's not just enough to, to sort of sound good and be a quote unquote fit. Uh, the aptitude has to be there too. So I always look at code. Uh, in fact, oftentimes I look at that first. We always ask all our programming applicants to send along some sort of sample code, right? Because the fact of the matter is, I mean, maybe that's brutal, but it takes very little. If I look at four source files, I usually have a very good um, indicator for whether this is a person that I see sort of that sparkle and promise for. And a lot of it comes down to, to sort of the mechanics of programming, the, the labor of programming. In, it's, it's kind of like a, a craft in the sense that like, if you're applying to be a, a blacksmith or whatever, right? Like, and and someone, you come into the blacksmith's um, den and he asks you, hey, swing this thing and, and craft this thing in five minutes, right? You see so much, you see so much technique, you see so much uh, approach in just a little bit of work. It's not a perfect indicator, but I find it's a way better indicator than what a lot of other software development companies use, which is puzzles. How many golf balls can you fit into a yellow bus that's driving through yeah. New York upside down? I don't give a, I don't give a damn about these sort of artificial um, puzzles and indicators of whether someone is quote unquote intelligent or whatever. I would have failed all of that. Um, I tweeted uh, uh, a while back, maybe it's, it's almost a year ago, that if I had done an interview and someone had asked me to go up to a whiteboard and implement a uh, bubble sort algorithm, I would have failed, right? And that struck a chord, I think, with a lot of people because that truly is how a lot of, especially the major tech companies are doing their interviews, that they're asking candidates to go up to a whiteboard and start programming some sort of algorithm that has no bearing or relation to the actual work that they have to do. Hey, if you're hiring sorting algorithms, or whatever persons ask that right if you ask if you're hiring people who need to build web applications that's the wrong question um, and in all the cases I think how many golf balls can fit in the yellow bus is the wrong question so that's a long way to say that we want to look at work but real work actual work representative work of what someone is actually going to be working on once we hire them right because that's really what matters um, but then at the same time, we hire a lot of junior developers at Basecamp. Uh, I actually find that in many ways, it is easier to hire a junior developer. I hear from people all the time, oh, we can't find these senior people. We need people to be able to, quote unquote, hit the ground running. That doesn't happen anyway. You hire a senior person and they're usually steeped in the ways of wherever they were working before and the ways that they were working before. I find that uh, a lot of junior developers are a lot more open to uh, the way we work, which in some ways are weird, in other ways are traditional, but just the, the fit of, of going from not having any preconceptions about how things work versus having to unlearn a lot of things of how things worked in whatever other environment they were in, it's actually easier to level up than it is to level sideways or level down in some senses. Um, so we've had a lot of luck hiring junior developers and just on, on promise and sparkle, as I like to say. Promise like, and sparkle. <laughs> yes, promise and sparkle. You look at an application, you look at the cover letter, you look at a, pieces, a few pieces of code, you have some human conversations about um, values and approaches to software and, and listen to that. And you know what? You can usually, in most cases, deduce a pretty good sense of, does this person have the promise and sparkle that we're looking for?
I love that. And that kind of also dovetailed into my question about leadership lessons and, and how you kind of, you know, leadership is really more about selection at the end of the day, I think is like, who are the right people to invest your time, energy, and attention and money into, right? Who's the right team to support you in your mission and vision? So you seem to have nailed that and have a really good understanding. What are some other companies or, or, you know, I know it's all about the code and like, I, I don't know in this world, I guess it's a good question. That you've looked at and you say, okay, these people have very solid product, very solid code that they've written, very solid programs that they've created, and I love their culture. What do you, who do you model and who do you look up to in the space? So it's funny, just yesterday I saw that Inc. had um, awarded uh, MailChimp Company of the Year, and I could not applaud that more. I love the story of MailChimp. So MailChimp... Um, I think it's been around for 18 years, not as MailChimp, the company that's doing what they're doing right now, but as the group of people who ended up building MailChimp in much the same ways as Basecamp was not always Basecamp. It was 37 signals back from 1999. So they had this long trajectory um, of sort of working at it. They took zero dollars of venture capital, which is one of my pet peeves and and sort of topics. So I deeply admire them for that. Um, they ended up building a company that today is doing half a billion dollars in revenue. They've been profitable since, I don't know, I think since the beginning. And they have 700 people working for them. And they built their business on the free open web in ways that are not scammy or spammy or s slimy or any of the other things that I would ascribe to a lot of sort of ad-driven businesses. Um, they simply sold a great piece of software for small companies to do email marketing. I mean, email alone, how unsexy of a technology is that? We just talked about AR and VR and all these exciting, sexy new technologies, right? Email, I've been around since what, late 60s, early 70s in some form, right? And here we have uh, a company of 18 years that's built a half a billion dollar a year business. On the back of that, bootstrapping their way to that um, and staying private. I love it. It's just amazing. Um, another company I have a lot of respect for, um, is sort of a little bit of self-dealing, Shopify. Um, good friend of mine, Toby, uh, was one of the early um, members of the Rails core group. And back in, I believe, 2003, 2004, he was building a shop called Snow Devil to sell snowboards. And he ended up just like we did with Basecamp in some ways to realize, hey, this piece of software I'm building to build a shop, like maybe we can make that into a shop, uh, software platform. And today he's running a billion dollar business based on Ruby and Rails. Um, and it's almost yeah, okay, the so they obstacle took becomes the way once again, right? We, we yep. had this problem and we solved it. We scratched our own itch and now everybody wants our solution. Totally, totally. In both of those cases, right? Like the same thing with MailChimp. Um, so I love those stories. I love those sort of, we didn't just sit down and brainstorm what kind of business should we start. Let's kind of like pursue something. No, we were trying to solve our own problems. And that usually turns into pretty good uh, solutions when you have that good of a focus group yourself to satisfy. So uh, MailChimp and, and Shopify, two good examples of companies I have a immense respect for. What's even better, I think, with both of them is another pet peeve of mine is that neither of them are based in Silicon Valley. Um, Basecamp is out of Chicago. MailChimp is out of uh, Atlanta. And Shopify is out of Ottawa, Canada. Just to show that there is a alternative path to sort of the state traditional approach. So how, how do you build a software company. Oh, you go to Silicon Valley, you raise a lot of money, you hire a bunch of people locally who pay, what, 4500 bucks a month for a closet to live in. Um, so I, I love the stories from, from, from all those angles as well, on top of the tech angles. That's beautiful. I love it. Um, okay, so I need to transition this conversation into the blockchain space. And I know crypto is exciting. You know, woohoo, everybody's making tons of money with crypto. Everybody's a genius in a bull market. But obviously, if you're like me, you probably think that blockchain is a more exciting development. Um, what are some of your thoughts about that? Uh, what are some of the industries you see being disrupted? Uh, are you dabbling at all in the blockchain space? And, and if so, what in what projects do you have going on there? Yeah, my main dabbling is I on it all the time on Twitter. I so, love it. Go, please. <laughs> Contrarian viewpoints, please. Coming up next. Um, and, and I think the main industry that, that Bitcoin right now has disrupted is the Ponzi scheme. This is the most effective Ponzi scheme of, I think, probably all time. At, 
at least it's the fastest growing Ponzi scheme of all time. And I think, um, I think it has a good likelihood of being the, the biggest ruin of all time. I was just so tweeting an article. Is this blockchain as no, a whole? No, this is Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Or just specifically to certain I, I think this, this, I mean, most of my commentary applies to Bitcoin in the way that, that has been rolled out. But I think it applies to the, um, what was the term? Irrational exuberance that's spreading across all of the cryptocurrencies right now. And right. the way that this whole thing has pivoted from like, oh, this is going to be like the fast, easy um, currency that we can use to buy things without uh, and transfer to money. To a speculative without. asset class. Right? And, right? and now we have, uh, yeah. now it's the fancy word for this is store value. I think the more accurate term for this is, is wild gambling market. Um, and I think that it's, I mean, I take a harder line on this in part because I want to provide as, as Derek Sivers calls a uh, counter melody. Well, There's and also of, I want to get your opinion because you understand the code. You can actually go look at the blockchain and tell me whether it's, you know, sound and secure as they all say it is. I don't know. You know, what the hell do I know? I just tell yeah, you. Yeah, I mean. The fact of the matter there is, it's just like with AR and VR, that is outside of my pay grade to some extent. Um, and, and I don't understand um, all of the technology. I have a I mean, the creator of Ruby or Rails doesn't know how it works, and maybe we do have a Ponzi scheme. Got it. <laughs> um, I think it, clearly there's something there. Clearly, the, the blockchain and, and the way of, of, um, of being able to verify these things and the, the single transfer, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's something there, right? Like, it's not like that there's nothing interesting about the underlying technology. What I'm finding just is that that is all getting swept up in the fact that this Ponzi scheme is running at 400,000 miles an hour right now, right? And I was <laughs> racking on Bitcoin back when it was worth 20 bucks, right? Um, so, to some, if clearly, and, and I get this pushback whenever I tweet anything that's even mildly critical of Bitcoin is like, well, you said that about 20 bucks. Yeah, because I intrinsically think that there are some problems here around the way we're, we're attaching to this and dealing with it and quote unquote reinventing banking and transfer of money and the future of money and so on that I think is complete. Um, that does, is, it's irrelevant what the value is. The fluctuation and so on is, is a far more um, pertinent point. The fact that Bitcoin has gone up, what, 15,000% in a single year, to me just underscores the fact that this is um, a wild west in all the negative aspects of that, uh, of that word. Um, but I, I think it's just, what I find so sort of hilarious, so I, I tweet about a lot of things, right? Um, I, I don't know, I have 50,000 50, tweets over the last uh, eight years or whatever. And I tweet about a lot of controversial things. I tweet about um, uh, Middle East peace process, um, U.S. foreign policy, um, literature, code, whatever, and nothing, absolutely nothing gets me the kind of pushback and scorn and attacks as if I tweet anything even mildly critical about crypto. Yeah, it's, it's the Lord of the Rings, but, you know, it's Gollum and the, my precious, ah, to my yeah, Bitcoin. Absolutely, that's exactly what it is, right? And I just find that so hilariously ironic um, from a sort of a community that's all about like, oh, we're this alternative, blah, 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 right? Like that any alternative viewpoint on what's going on right now is seen as sort of an attack on like, um, on the whole movement as such and, and on the technology. But I mean, the technology itself, I think, is also just hilarious. I was just reading an article this um, morning about how the transaction price on, on Bitcoin has spiked to $26 per transaction uh, at certain times, right? And you just go like, hey, wait a minute, did you guys just tell me like five years ago this was about fast, free transactions that were, some of the, I, what really gets me is some of the um, use cases that you hear present. Oh yeah, you can have this guy in uh, New York sending Bitcoin to the farmer in Kenya and he can just buy a new plow and like, yeah, right. Like yeah, all that and, shit got thrown out the window. The fair. second the champagne bottles popped with all the, you can buy Cristal now with the Bitcoin, right? And, but and just like anything, you know, it's it's looking like there are going to be different blockchain enabled currencies that will usurp Bitcoin and ultimately create that as, yes, that's the progenitor. Yes, it has its limitations. Yes, it has its problems. But I, I do believe, at least in my own opinion, uh, I, I'm happy to be wrong. And I, I tell everybody always, you know, don't ever invest an amount of money that you're not comfortable losing 100% of, like literally all of, overnight without recourse forever, because that's essentially what we're dealing with here. There's no recourse. If it goes away, if it goes up tomorrow, if somebody hacks it, whatever, it's gone. So 
uh, starting with that caveat, I do believe that underneath all of this, this blockchain thing may have some legs. It's just a better system for a lot of reasons in its theoretical component, in its state that it currently exists in. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right with like Bitcoin being, it's ridiculous. Like 90% of wallets are $100 or less worth of Bitcoin. Like who's going to transact those wallets? Ever, you know, most of them have been lost, or maybe the Fed picked them up, or whatever, or stolen, you know? or, or any stolen. Of the you lost the keys, and like it's just right. ridiculous. So the amount of actual players in this currency, it's going to eventually get so consolidated that it's going to be ridiculous, and therefore have to well, collapse. I, I, I will take it even harder line because uh, I, I think I've heard a lot of commentary of like, oh well, um, the exuberance that's going on right now in Bitcoin in particular is ridiculous, but the underlying thing is really good. I'd actually, I'm starting to question the underlying thing too, because I think it's actually a really dystopian, um, cynical view of society to think that money in this sense has to be um, so disconnected from the world that it exists in, so, to be so unregulated as it is with Bitcoin, to be so enabling as it is. Um, I don't think that there's a, a sort of, I don't think it's a surprise the main adoption of Bitcoin in the terms of the currency aspect, at least, not the speculation aspect, but the currency aspect, is, is not necessarily the most savory bits. And you can say, I've, I've heard the argument too, well, yeah, I mean, criminals also use cars. That doesn't make all cars criminals. But if you look and at the percentage of actual transaction uh, volume and interest and, and sort of the, the use of it, the untraceability and so on, Mm, it sort of tilts one way, which to me is the same way in many ways as you look at uh, American gun policy. Not all gun owners go out and shoot people, but like sort of, there's a problem with the underlying mechanism here that I think is deeper than just like, uh, um, well, you can use this for good things or whatever too. I think it's a very cynical view of society actually. And I think it's, it's uh, I saw a thing from 2015, I think, uh, 82 persons in the U.S. had declared their gains in Bitcoins to the IRS. I think that summed it up pretty well, right? This is about 80, 82 people in, in 2015, right? There were probably more than 82 people. And to be fair, that's a, that's a couple of years old and before this latest bull run, right? But I'd be surprised if that number today is getting anywhere near close to the number of people who, at least in paper or in bits, made the wealth that they've made on bitcoin they're all going to declare it now people are using this to to stuff it into the mattresses and hide it and, and do all sorts of other things that i don't think is actually good for society i think societies uh i think the the value of this system the untraceability and irreversibility and all these factors of it make a lot of sense if you're in freaking venezuela or north korea or any highly repressive societies but when used in Western societies um, that are supposed to have sort of strong, well-developed um, sort of civic systems and institutions, uh, I think it's a way to get to the societies. It's a way to get to Venezuela. It's a way to get to North Korea. And that, I mean, that's wild extrapolation, but I, that's, I'm, I'm not, I don't even like the underpinnings. I don't like what it says about society. I don't like what it says about debt and money and um, these other factors to it. Notwithstanding that I completely respect the, the technology, right? Um, and I will also accept that uh, I have, you could call it double standards on this point. When it comes to cryptography in general, for example, I am a fervent believer that say the government should not have um, the golden key to break any encryption of WhatsApp or iMessage or any other forms of encryption because I, I do believe that um, we need privacy when it comes to the exchange of information and communication. I don't think that that applies in nearly the same way when it comes to currencies. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of topics there and, and I can go on ranting oh, on that. Huge. Yeah, and, I and I have, and I accept the fact that I could totally be wrong and Bitcoin tomorrow could go to 200 billion a coin and everyone could go like, hey, if you listen to David, you would have missed out on this crazy wealth generation, right? Yeah, but I, even I, that in itself is also just such a misnomer, right? So wealth generation, like, is there a productive capacity of Bitcoin? No. No. Where is all this coming from? Because money's flowing in, right? Like this money's not being generated. This is not, That's we're not right. growing the GDP here of the world. Right. It's not like it really has utility at this moment. No, exactly. Speculative Which interest. can be said of other things, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think that there's just something here that this money isn't free. It's not just appearing out of, 
thin air. It's worth ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars a coin now, um, because that's what people bid it up to, which means that all this money is, is flowing in from somewhere. And usually, that ends in a in a sucker punch for for, for the last sucker. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really brilliant, and I appreciate you uh, being passionate about it. And um, you're right. Ultimately, you're right. You know, and I share a lot of your your kind of um, residence about the whole thing. But then again, I've managed to get into Bitcoin at under 100 bucks. You know, I was looking at it at five cents. I didn't buy any then. I should have, but whatever. Um, you know, I could have been a billionaire that one time. Um, no, seriously, I could have bought 100,000 Bitcoins at five cents. I had the money I put into a Bitcoin trading app for a kid who was trying to build Coinbase. He was out of his element. I could have just put that money into Bitcoins. It would have been telling it. Which, I mean, that's really what gets me in part about this this right now with, with Bitcoin is that a lot of people are looking at that and, and they're using that as justification for why they should get in now, right? Hey, no, if and, I had bought and, it- And that's what I tell everybody is don't, you don't have a, a crystal ball and you don't have a time machine. So you're not going to be able to replicate these kinds of results, period. Exactly, which is the same thing as saying like, hey, if I had bought Apple stock um, yeah. five years ago, if I had uh, known the lottery numbers of yesterday, yesterday, um, you, we could have done all these things, right? So the coulda, woulda, shoulda, I think it's just more appealing in some ways with Bitcoin is because it feels more accessible or whatever. And the returns are so spectacular, right? Which is why I've, I've likened it to penny stocks in the past. Normal um, companies raising money and exchanging or selling equity, they're not raising, they're not jumping 15,000% in a year, right? Like these sorts of spectacular returns are only really generally accessible in very unsavory territories. And mm -hmm. I mean, that is part of it uh, where I feel like it, the wagon is just unhinged right now. So David, I know you have a lot going on right now and we want to be here and be supportive and we're grateful for you sharing your, you know, your wisdom and collected, um, kind of opinions about things over the years and things that you've thought a lot about, obviously. Uh, and the Make More Morals podcast is all about helping people win more through collaboration as opposed to just competition. And I'm sure you're a fan and a proponent of that. You wouldn't have even agreed to be on the show. So we appreciate you being here. What are some ways that we can help you with connections, resources, opportunities, people, systems to move your mission forward faster? Well, one of the things I'm passionate about as we talk about these things is a diversity of narratives. Diversity of narratives when it comes to Bitcoin, as we just talked about right now, um, there's a lot of excitement and there should be in a well-functioning system, um, criticism and counters and uh, opposition to these sorts of things, regardless of whether the thing in itself turns out to be the best thing ever. The only way you kind of get an informed society, I believe, is, is that you have opposing forces uh, looking at the, the issue from, from both ends, which is why I sometimes take an even more aggressive stance on certain topics than perhaps the merits just outright warrant, simply because to provide that counter narrative. The same is true when it comes to our story of how to build a business and building it in a untraditional fashion, at least through the lens of software coming out of Silicon Valley and so on. So we try to spread this message. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, posts up on Medium, for example, that um, where I try to provide this counter narrative. Uh, reconsider is one of them that you can point your followers or listeners to. Um, there is, um, I have another thing about uh, uncontrolled growth and uh, actually the problems with that, which is also part of where this Bitcoin criticism in some strains come from, um, that this unnatural expansion I think is often I have a quote yeah. I think you like a lot. Growth without contribution is the motto of cancer, right? Yes. Unchecked growth will just continue to create more problems for itself. Yes. And I think that that, I mean, as we just talked about Bitcoin, I think in itself, there are just problems with something expanding at the rate of this thing is expanding right now, right? Um, like a black hole that's in, uh, ultimately going to end up swallowing the world. And anyway, I, I, that's why I try to, that's why I enjoy, I enjoy looking at, um, topics from the angle of like, what is the prevailing narrative here? Let's explore the counter narrative to that. And then um, what I've also then found is that not only is that counter narrative fun to explore, it's often also what I didn't end up believing after examining both narratives, both the narrative and the counter narrative is that the counter narrative is more appealing and that I will actually personally want to live and work like that 
That's certainly how we've treated things when it comes to business practices and so forth. That's how we ended up writing rework and, and other things. They weren't speculative treatises on how we think the world should work. No, they were accounts of how we actually operate in the world, how we run our business, how we do things differently, how we live the counter narrative. So pointing to, to those things, reconsider and medium, rework at the book. Um, we have a new book coming up this uh, new year called The Calm Company. Um, that we're pretty excited about. Um, it was all born out of Jason having a ponder on the very common notion where people say, oh, it's so crazy at work. Hmm. Oh, how are you doing? Oh, it's crazy at work. Why is it cr crazy at work? Why is it good that it's crazy at work? Why are you celebrating that it's crazy at work? Why are you wearing that like it's a badge of honor? Hmm. And we went like, that's not how we want things to be. That's certainly not how we want to run Basecamp. That's not how we want to run our business. We don't want it to run crazy. We want it to run calm. How, what are some of the principles and approaches that you can take if you want a calm business, not a crazy business? And what are some of the advantages you can get out of running a company like that? So that is the premise of our new book, uh, The Calm Company. Hope to release that in 2018. Got to finish writing it, but it's, uh, it's pretty well underway so far. Um, so that's probably the stuff I want to pick. And no, if, that's, if that's you want beautiful. To hear is there a specific URL or link, or do you have a personal website where all these are linked? Uh, yep. Um, I'll your Twitter it, or spin, spell it. It's david.heinemarihansen.com. Maybe you can link that in your show notes. But what Perfect. is easy to remember is on Twitter, I'm at DHH, and that's a certain place where right now you can get plenty of bitcoin counter narrative <laughs> <laughs> and um and otherwise pointers to all the other stuff that i'm doing and writing and thinking about beautiful david thank you so much for being on the show and on behalf of everybody in the make more marvels community thank you for being here um and if there's any parting words of wisdom for the audience i'd love to hear um well i'd say in, in general i mean this is hard to try, but I, uh, don't look for the silver bullet. Don't look for the one thing you wanted to do different. Don't look for the, the regret. Um, love your fate. Figure out how to fall in love with the things that you are, have and the path that you're on and the learning that you're taking. Don't look back at things with regret. That's not tried at all. That's beautiful. Thank you, David. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for listening to the Make More Marbles podcast. For more tips, hacks, and strategies to create an amazing, abundant life in your health, wealth, and relationships, whatever that means to you, head on over to makemoremarbles.com. Check out our cool explainer video about what we're about and join our community of entrepreneurial game changers. We want to help you level up your life in every possible way. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and please do leave a review. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next podcast.